All muted. I would love it if you would read the chalice lighting with me. Life is a gift for which we are grateful. We gather in community to celebrate the glories and the mysteries of this great gift. And again, together, let's read um, this portion of our congregational covenant. In this house, we covenant with one another to build our connections on a foundation of love, hope, and faith, to accept responsibility for our individual acts, and to work together to promote equity, justice, equality, justice, and peace, to stand on the side of love, embracing the liberation of oppressed minorities and championing all movements to end discrimination, to communicate with kindness and support, and to serve with compassion and commitment. Molly. Molly, you're muted. The following reading is by Carl McCargo. When you look deep into, when you look deep into the dynamics of hate, you see the brutality of the chattel enslavement consciousness. When you look into the dynamics of sexism, you see the depravity of chattel enslavement consciousness. When you look into the dynamics of global warming, you see the corruption of the chattel enslavement consciousness. When you look into the dynamics of racism, you see the inhumanity of the chattel enslavement consciousness. When you look into the dynamics of classism, you see the greed of the chattel enslavement consciousness. And when you look into the mirror, I hope you see a person who is as spiritually burdened by brutality, depravity, corruption, inhumanity, and greed as I, then we can be allies focusing on the real soul of our nation. It takes courage to face the truth.
Carl's up next with his slideshow. Okay. Yeah, Carl. Um, just the uh, the just I've got the 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 slides to run, uh, but the script was I don't think I have the script. But so just give me a clue. Just tell me when to change the slide. Okay, we'll do. Um, thank you for the introduction, Kate and Dan. Um, the complexity and challenge of reparations and our role in it. I wish I could say that after my sermon, everyone will be anti-racist and at peace and in harmony with our culture, but I can't. What I can tell you is that after my sermon, you will be on a better road to find that peace and harmony. Slide one. Slide one, Dan. My view of why we need reparation is that the consciousness that created chattel enslavement, that defended chattel enslavement, and nurtured chattel enslavement during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and was still alive and strong in the 20, 20th century, and now is still strong in the 21st century. We see that chattel enslavement consciousness in America's Jim Crow. We saw that consciousness in the era of America's apartheid. We see the brutality of chattel enslavement in our society's high, highest crime rate among industrialized nations. And we also see the greed of chattel enslavement manifest in our highest income disparity of all industrialized nations. And there is much more evidence of that continued presence of chattel enslavement consciousness. Today, I approached reparations from the input of four voices. Each voice below has contributed to or share my belief in how to approach reparations in healing. Slide two. The reason it is necessary to discuss, study, and engage reparations is because our nation practiced that phenomena of chattel enslavement for over two and a half centuries. And reparation is the necessary response for the healing from that era. Reparation is a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of the crimes against humanity that were perpetrated against them. Slide number three. In COBRA, the National Coalition of Black Soul Reparation in America has identified five areas of injury caused by chattel enslavement. Quote, informed, honest historians and social scientists acknowledge the lingering effects of slavery on present day African-American life. Accordingly, in 1996 and 1997, the NCOBRA Legal Strategies Commission set out to develop an approach to reparations litigation. That came out and um, eventually became adopted as HD40 and S1083. The commission's work to, led to the identification and documentation of five injury areas suffered by African-American people during and after enslavement. Those five injury areas include destruction of personhood and nationhood. Personhood, if you watch the series on Roots many years ago, 
you might have seen Toby being whipped because, uh, well, Kunte being whipped because he would not change his name to Toby. That was one way that you stole a person's personhood. The second area is denial of education. It was basically cruelly punished if an African person learned to read, you could get your tongue cut out. And that was severe punishment for a person who taught that person to read. The third area is denial of health care and treatment. We all know of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment where African Americans with syphilis were not treated, they were just observed. And there were other crimes. And the targeted for criminal punishment, the fourth area. Unequal protection under the law is probably one of the most devastating destructions of uh, and oppressions of a people. When you could lose your life for being black. And exclusion from wealth and condemned and therefore condemned to perpetual poverty. After the um, Civil War, um, uh, after emancipation, before the end of the Civil War, um, Ulysses, uh, Grant Sher uh, Sherman, General Sherman had uh, granted the 40 acres and a mule to 20,000 African Americans. And that was in place until Lincoln was assassinated and Johnson took over. He immediately took the land away from the blacks and gave it back to the slaver, enslavers. And um, the author of that article, last name was Holloway, said that had those just those 20,000 African Americans been allowed to keep their land, it would amount to about $6.1 billion trillion in today's money. But that land was stolen and it has continued stealing land from African Americans up to this day. Begin slide four. People of African descent has been enduring this treatment since 1619. Even while their contributions and labor brought America onto the global scene as a major economic and military power. Now, this is a quote from Edward Batiste, describes how chattel enslavement's global contributions, not just con contributions to America, but to the global humanity. Quote, Dependence on cotton stretched far beyond North American shores. A world greedy for a slice of the super profits had financed the occupation of the continent and the forced migration of enslaved Africans to the southwestern cotton fields helped make the modern world economy possible. The modern world economy. The steadily increasing productivity on the cotton frontiers kept cheap raw materials flowing to the world's newest and most important industry, the cotton textile factories of Britain, Western Europe, and the North, which was the colonies. Theft of days and years from enslaved Africans helped provide the escape velocity for the fledgling modern world to do what no other historical society had done before and pull away from the gravitational field of the Malthusian cul-de-sac. Slavery's expansion was a driving force in US history between the framing of the constitution and the beginning of the civil war. And that's from his book called The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. So therefore, don't allow any anti-reparationist 
to tell you that rep reparation is another welfare ploy. Start showing number five. It took centuries for chattel enslavement to be perfected into the legal status that it attained. Therefore, the issue will not be easily overcome. It is my perspective that yes, those legalized aspects of chattel enslavement are over and has been for centuries. But now there are vestiges of it that are as brutal as the legalized version. I call this the chattel enslavement consciousness. I will focus on several contributors and how their work can help our country heal from that past. My focus will be the complexities of chattel enslavement and our roles in it. The quote above by Edward Batiste should speak to some of the complexities of chattel enslavement. It is not just about money, but Baptist quote shows that there is very substantial evidence that more than money is involved. In fact, money may not be the salient issue of reparations repair. If we were taught true American history, you would be able to see more of those truths. I would like to start with the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His quote is key to where change begins. As in the lyrics to Man in the Mirror, it starts with me and it starts in the heart. And secondly, Dr. King's approach is gentle, honest, and humanitarian. Here's a quote by Dr. King. It has played havoc with our domestic destinies. This day, we are spending $500,000 to kill every Vietnam Viet Cong soldier. Every time we kill one Viet Cong soldier, we have spent about $500,000. While we spend only $53 a year for every person characterized as poverty stricken in the so-called poverty program, which is not even a good skir skirmish, skirmish against poverty. The depth of his empathy is awe-inspiring. He goes further and says, you can't legislate morality. You have to win hearts first. Dr. King knew that when you legislate anything, there will always be rancor for some. Look at what is happening to Roe v. Wade. Look at what is happening to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Not enough hearts were won. Would you start showing slide six, please? I want to say to each of you that in my approach to reparations, there is no blame on the individual. Everything that gave rise to chattel enslavement that maintained it was planned, demonstrated, taught, and legislated by our founding fathers. In other words, it was legal. Everyone had to return a person who ran away from that institution because it was the law. Slide six. You've got to be carefully taught. I have always looked very closely at our culture how it teaches racism, sexism, brutality, and greed. We all may get a hint after watching a week or so of our American TV, some of those ways that we're taught violence and brutality. The two slides below will hint at what white supremacy messaging has looked like. Over the years, these messages may become invisible because to some, these messages have become empowering and affirming 
and therefore easily internalize. They have become the re reality of our culture to us, we the people. Slide seven. Okay, that's it. This means that you are no longer able to protect yourself from the harmful teachings of white supremacy. That, that essence of the chattel enslavement consciousness. You may not know that cowboys were 30% to 50% of the American West. You also may not know that some of the first cattle barons west of the Mississippi River were African Americans. When Africans came here from Africa, there were several things that they were expert in and contributed mightily to the knowledge of America. One, they knew how to domesticate animals. And number two, they knew how to grow rice. And that was really um, major contributions to this nation. Slide eight, please. Oh, that's slide eight. Okay. And next slide. Slide nine. My belief is that if we continue learning the media messages of white supremacy, the consciousness of chattel enslavement, we will only, it will only become stronger and more resistant to change. Um, slide 10. And can you go back up to seven? Let's see what seven looks like. Yes, that's okay, that's it after that one. The next slide. My belief is that we were taught, this is how we were taught. When white America had John Wayne, Susan Hayward, Charleston Heston, Cary Grant, Debbie Reynolds, et cetera, et, et cetera. African-Americans had Toms, Coons, Mulettos, Mammies, and Bucks. On the left of this first photo, you will see this image of African-Americans, the gangster and the loose sexual African-American woman did not support white supremacy. Therefore, it was barely, rarely shown this type of African-American on in the movies. Does this does not support white supremacy. It may support the dream and the ideals of American culture, but it does not support white supremacy. Next slide, please. Ruby D offers a message that is very relevant and speak to opportunities missed. She says, if filmmakers could assume the responsibility of good citizens, could stress the best within the human capacity and strive to make that commercial, the world might become a different and better place. I earnestly, believe that had the filmmakers taken it up on themselves to help create the proper climate for integration to occur, racism would have disappeared from this country. And that was from uh, Films for Peace and Justice. Um, and it was uh, put on by the War Resistance League. And slide uh, 10, please. The only thing necessary for tranquility in the world is that every child grows up happy. The, the photo to the right asks the question, are white children the only children who matter? The next slide, please. You all may have remembered the movie Dookie, 
Dookie Hauser. Um, Dookie Hauser was a, what do you call it? A, a cultural appropriation of this gentleman on the left, Bal Murali Krishna Bala Ambadi. He was the real character on who Doki Hauser was based on. And in May of 1995, he entered the Guinness Book of Rep uh, Records for being the world's youngest doctor at the age of 17 years old and 295 days. So this is how you are being carefully taught. I might also refer you to a Google this term, and uh, I'll make this available, called white savior tropes. That's a repeated theme in movies. A trope is a repeated theme in movies. And white savior is the theme of many movies, you know, such as a white person going to a, a black neighborhood and teaching them to read and write. Um, they're the savior of people of color who can't do anything for themselves, but we know that's not true. Slide 12, please. Oh, 10, slide 10, that's it. Oh, yeah, slide 12. The, the third voice that I would like to bring in is James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed but nothing can be changed until it is faced. What is Baldwin trying to tell us here? What does he mean? His message becomes clearer when we confront the question, what can I do? In reality, social justice starts with I. I interpret Baldwin's statement to mean I may be part of the problem. I may need to reevaluate my deep personal beliefs. We all want to be right. Let's face that reality. But what do we do if we aren't? That is sometimes a hard realization to accept. That's what, that's what I think Baldwin is trying to tell us. You may face a realization, but you may not be able to accept the truth of it. You surely will not be able to change yourself or to change the world if you don't face the fact that you may not be as liberal as you wish you could and I wish you were. As the lyrics of the song and Michael Jackson says, I'm starting with the man or the woman in the mirror. Let me say this. You didn't legalize chattel enslavement, but you have been taught that white supremacy was the great truth. The quote by Baldwin tells us a lot. I'm not interested in anybody's guilt. Guilt is a luxury we can no longer afford. I know you didn't do it, and I didn't do it either but I am responsible for it because I am a man and a citizen of this country. And you are responsible for it too, for the very same reason. So the truth is our founding fathers were the ones that legalized chattel slavery. If you feel guilty because you may be more of a white supremacist than you thought, don't. You have been betrayed, just as I have been betrayed. You have been taught to be a white supremacist, just as I was. But you and I have to face that reality, that brutal reality, if we want to change our nation. Slide 13, please. The fourth and final voice that I bring to this conversation is Brian Stevenson. 
this famous quote for me is, um, four things you need to do to change the world. One, you have to be proximate to the problem. You can't do it long distance as well as you could if you were close. How many persons of a different culture have you had for dinner or a picnic for ice cream? We have to change the narrative. That's his second statement. And most of the time when you hear reparationists talking, they will use the word enslavement, not slave owners. En enslaver for slave, for a person who might be called a slave owner. You never owned a African slave. You can see that in the fact that every chance they got, they would run away if they could. And that continues to this day. We fight, we're on some of the front lines of anti-racism work. Number three, we have to remain hopeful. Sometimes there are gloomy days and we feel like it's all over, but Rebecca Parker's quote that we will get to later helps us make a stand. Also, hope is what will wake you up in the morning, ready and passionate about working on that issue whatever issue your heart's values. And sometimes we have to do uncomfortable things. He says, I believe people are more than the worst thing they've ever done. He said, explaining that the gospel idea of redemption is bigger than the legal system's idea of justice. I believe the opposite of poverty is not wealth, but justice. He said, lamenting that in America, you are better off if you're guilty and rich than if you're innocent and poor. And he has a TED talk that you can um, um, see on most, most stations, but on, on a TED talk. S um, slide 14, if you have that incorporated. Yes, thank you. What can you do? What can we do? It is very important to get familiar with action. Therefore, an action assignment seems to be in order. It may sound easy, too easy, but it's not easy, as easy as it appears. This assignment is tied to the contribution of you've got to be carefully taught. And Brian Stevenson's changed narrative, our media, that subtle teacher of white supremacy. Using the concept of connotation and denotation, try to contextually identify the meaning of the word dark. I don't know how many times I've heard the use of that word dark, dark money, the dark side of this family, the dark side of this crime. What are they doing? They're at this once in, 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 in this statement, they're teaching us dark is something omnipotent almost, but mostly evil. So check yourself on that. Ask yourself, what does dark mean in that context? I can't figure out every, every connotation that I've heard dark used in. There may not be any, they just might want to play on the horrors of, that we can create in our minds. The dark money, the dark politics, those are ominous suggestions there for dark. And we have to be carefully taught and that's what is happening. So we have to carefully untaught, unteach ourselves. And that's where I think James Baldwin comes in and Brian Stevenson who says, you have to do uncomfortable things. 
one of those uncomfortable things might be to face yourself. And James Baldwin says, you know, uh, you can't change it if you don't face it. But that's what, that's what change is all about. We have to also get informed. Um, so if you do that and, and see where it leads you, that's on your assignment. What are other issues can you think of that would forward the issue of reparations? Uh, here's some suggestions. Book discussions, a film series, discussions of the above exercise around connotations of dark. Such groups can also be seen as a source of support if you come up into the area of white supremacy, which you are in yourself, which you are unaware. A venue that's part of a venue for self-care. Slide 15, do you have that, Dan? Why I think is a question that is not normally incorporated into social justice. Why? We all know what, we all know where, and we all know who, but we don't know why. At the film festival in uh, Greenfield, I think uh, we may have seen the movie um, Healing from Hate. And that shows how racist and white supremacists and Klan members possibly are taught to be who they are. Why? If we could answer that question about a social justice or social action, we would be halfway to the solution. Americans need to know how to protect themselves from the messages and teachings of white supremacy. If we have grown up on coons, mulattoes, bucks, and mammies, we may not see that as a theft of my personhood, but it's there. And we have to be able to de defend ourselves, challenge the media's message, wonder about it. So we have to protect ourselves and understanding the media is a real important part of that. This quote at the bottom of why is taken from the director of operations at the Whitney Plantation in Edgar, Edgar, Louisiana. Now, I went to JA in New Orleans and we also made a visit to the Whitney Plantation. And they have a plantation from the perspective they recreated plantation from the perspective of the persons who were enslaved. And this is how, this quote reveals how white supremacists and enslavers protected themselves against the egregious inhumanity they perpetrated against African people. Regardless of how these individuals fed the people they owned, owned, and I would challenge that as Brian Stevenson would tell me to do, but as they co-opted, regardless of how they clothed them, regardless of if they never laid a hand on them, they were still sanctioning the system. You can't say, hey, that person kidnapped our child from Africa, but he fed them well. They were, they were a good person. How absurd does that sound? That's the quote from Yvonne Holden, Director of Operations at Whitney Plantation in Edgard, Louisiana. The War on Nostalgia by Clint Smith. And that's all, uh, that quote might also be in the Atlantic of June 2021, pages 52 and 61. Therefore, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you 
and I look forward to following the following discussion. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kate. Thanks so much, Carl. And I know um, I know we we could have some time at the end of the service, which is fast approaching, to um, ask questions and talk about this. So um, the next is um, I'm going to share my screen. And go to our benediction. You're muted, Carl. In this world, there is injustice and violence, quiet genocide, unanswered tragedy. But there is a place in you that cries out in the face of this reality that it is not so. A place, a place in you that cries out in the face of this reality that it is not so. A place in you that is capable of moral courage. Molly. Yes, um, there is a place in you that is capable of grasping the possibilities of a different way of living with one another. There is a place in you that is capable of creating, of bringing into being the possibilities that you can grasp and imagine. There is a place in you that knows and feels that though the soul and body can be oppressed on every side, crushed or even destroyed, there is something that will not die. There is something that will rise again, always coming to life like April. There is a place in you that knows that in the deepest soul suffering and grief, there yet will be rest for the weary. And the promise is true. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Because there is this place in you. You, as you are, are the hope of the world. And you must do only one thing. Keep faith with who you are. Now's our opportunity for joys and sorrow. Please um, unmute yourself if you would like to um, share something with our community. And just um, if I could, if I could, uh, I'd like to share a concern or a sorrow. Uh, my uh, cousin Kathy uh, passed away last week because she had a medical issue and went to the hospital in Arizona. And because they were so full of COVID patients, the doctor said, we can't really, we don't have space for you. You'd be better off at home. And she passed away that night. Mm -hmm. Wow. I see Rob Peck has raised his hand. You also, also, um, since we have 30 people, if there's a reactions tab and you can raise your hand electronically and we might see that faster. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you, Dan. Uh, that kind of electronics is beyond my technical ability. I know it's not that hard. Um, Carl, first of all, thank you. Um, you've reinforced the reason that my friend and our beloved member Kirsten has 
encouraged me to read the book, Me and White Supremacy. Um, I am certainly experiencing some of what Brian Stevenson talked about in terms of feeling uncomfortable. And I get it that Baldwin's right. Unless you're able to face it, nothing will shift. So thanks for being another voice, reinforcing that incredibly important message. I also want to light a candle of both sorrow and joy that I have two friends, Peter and Daniel, both of whom have had very hard medical things, one a stroke, the other COVID, and both, at least as of the last time I spoke with them, which was pretty recent, are not only hanging in there, but showing really resilient and amazing healing capacity. So for Daniel and Peter. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Nancy, are you raising your hand? Yes, I'm just trying to unmute myself. I'd like to show a um, candle of concern for the people in Colerain who have lost property and hopefully only property in the fire last night. That's very concerning. Thank you. Maybe that's, oh, there's Pam. You have to unmute yourself, yourself, Pam. Sorry. I'd like to thank Carl for his thoughtful, well-developed sermon for us today. And just to say that I'm really impressed with the pink shirt. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Ellen? Hi, I just... Uh like to light a candle of concern for the people of Afghanistan who are have been left uh, with nothing uh, by our own government and their allies puppy. and um, you know they're starving and freezing because they can't get to their money and America having abandoned them uh, very rapidly and handed power over to the Taliban are now enforcing sanctions against the Taliban for being, uh, you know, a, a terrorist organization, which makes no freaking sense to me at all. So this is my concern about those people. And I feel like as Americans, we are responsible for them. So I'm going to write some letters, but thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Kylie. Um, I would just like to say, um, like, thank you to Carl for um, your words. Um, they just, they gave me so much strength and um, hope to, like, keep standing up for racism. And, um, and it makes me believe that there is, like, hope for our future because sometimes, like, it's, I feel a little bit, like, hopeless just because of all the stuff that's happening in the world but it is just so helpful to hear your passionate words. Um, and it is so important for my generation to hear because I have like a lot of people just aren't aware. And I think it is so important to spread this message. Um, and it is just such a gift and an honor to be able to listen to your incredible words. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing that presentation with us. It was so incredible. Wonderful, Kylie, so glad you were here. Pam? 
you got to unmute. Uh, one additional thing. This this afternoon, about four o'clock, or I, it took me to three thirty to get on onto it. But I've been able to sign up to make telephone calls in Texas mm -hmm. to encourage people to vote. And um, there's you, you, the boat. You all might want to be aware of. This is like one way we can really manifest something because Texas alone, if it would mobilize, would shift the political repression that we are now facing. Okay. End preach, preaching. Thanks. Well, let's continue on to our last hymn and I will share the screen. Thank you so much for sharing everybody. Oh, wait a second. That's the one.
Hold on. Oh, all right, yes. I had one more slide, but it doesn't seem to be showing up and I want to show up. There we are. Now it's time for coffee hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, Lori does. Lori's got uh, it's a picture of Lori with her dog, too. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Anyway, let's let's um, take this opportunity to chat. And take. OK, and I'll I'll uh, I'll say farewell to our friends on YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure what I've got here in the chat. Anyway, we're going to we'll stop the YouTube live.